Like any other style, the PS1's aesthetic is born of limitation. The PS1 has a few quirks in the hardware that make it very unique and produce the classic look we all know and love. I'm going to run you through everything here step by step, so if you already have models or you just want to composite, feel free to skip around to these sections. But if you're just starting off, I'm going to be making this little crate here, as well as running through a small scene I made just to show off the different ways you can stylistically reach with this PS1 hardware look. Let's begin. Low poly modeling is probably not as difficult as you think, because in reality, what we are doing is making these low poly models so that our textures can do all the heavy lifting for us. Because the PS1 had very, very limited hardware, meaning that rendering a bunch of polygons at once was not really a possibility. So, you can see we have this character here. This is the main character from the original Silent Hill, and he's got quite a bit of detail, you know, he, he looks pretty good, especially for the time. But if we come into the non-textured view, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess. If you showed this to your boss as a 3D artist, they would probably kill you. But the texture really brings it all together and makes it look really nice. So you're basically just going to be modeling entirely for performance. So for example, I have this crate you may model. If you're making a game, this is probably something you would create as an asset. It's fairly low poly. This would run really well on a game engine. But... If we're going for the PS1 style, we want to minimize as much as we can. So our crate would actually look a little more like this, just a cube. Because we are going to let the texturing do all that heavy lifting for us. We don't need any of this indentation because there's not going to be any actual light hitting our cube. It's, it's just going to be the texture. The other thing to focus on is how characters are approached, especially deformation because in a lot of modern models, they will tell you, make sure you add extra geometry to where your arms are going to bend. But in these older models, we can see that here at the knee, we just have one band. So if we were to actually bend this character's leg, we'll bend it up, looks pretty nice. And then we do this and it crushes down. This is not how a human being's body works. <laughs> but because of the hardware, they couldn't do anything about that. So even though I would love it if this model deformed correctly, if I'm going for the PS1 style, if I move her leg up here, you can see that it crushes down into a tiny little toothpick. And that is completely by intention. I could add edge loops very, very easily. But because this is how the model worked, we are staying completely faithful to the hardware. And that's going to add authenticity to the render when it finally comes out. I'm going to link in the description where I got this model. It's a website called the Models Resource, and they actually have models from basically any PS1 game just stored in here for you to download, for you to look at. You can look at the texture sheets, you can look at the characters, and you can completely see how they work and base your work off of them. But since we have a nice model, let's move on to texturing our beautiful, beautiful crate. So the first thing we're going to do is actually find a crate texture. So if I look up crate texture, obviously do not go on Google and steal someone else's texture. If you're making a game, you should make your own. I'm just doing this for tutorial's sake. So we're going to save this crate image. It looks like I've actually already saved this before, which is pretty cool. And we are going to open up GIMP. So now that we have our crate on here, we are going to first completely downscale this image. So for these older textures, I would recommend sticking around the texture resolution of 120 to 240. So because this is a prop, I'm going to go with a really, really low texture size. So we're going to come to image, come to scale image, and we are going to take the size of our image all the way down to 120 pixels, which is incredibly small, but since this in an actual game would probably be a background asset, nobody's really gonna notice. So once we get that in and we zoom, you can see that it already looks pretty PSX. This is a very low res image. But there's one more thing we can do to further compress the image that they would also do back in the day, and that is coming to image, going to mode, coming to indexed, and basically just crushing down the amount of colors in the image altogether because right now all of these browns are fading together very nicely, but that takes up a lot of storage. There are a lot of different colors in this image. So what this does is make sure that there are only a maximum of eight colors in this image. For objects with a lot of colors, you can bump this up to around 16, but I would stick to eight, especially if it's a background asset. And we're going to turn on dithering. So this is basically a way of blending different colors together efficiently. So if you have a model that has flat shading, kind of like the Astrid model I was showing you earlier, 
I would not do dithering. I would set this to none because it's going to kind of fuck up the model and add a little bit of like weird speckles and it doesn't look too great. But for a model like this, if we press convert, you can see that the dithering adds this really nice retro style shading to it that looks just absolutely incredible. I, I love how this comes out. So now we are going to export as and we're going to head back over to Blender. So now that we're in Blender, we're going to unwrap this model, not before adding seams on every side, because every side is going to be the same. And then the way we're going to unwrap this is just selecting each side and pressing unwrap so that every single side is unwrapped exactly the same. So now that we've done that, we're going to come to shading, add a new material, I'll call it crate. And we're going to add an image texture. And we are going to find our crate. So the next thing we'll do is that if you want to go for the N64 style, the N64 would blend together colors kind of like this. That's why a lot of people complain that the N64 looks blurry in some ways. And that is because of this linear option. Basically, it's just lightly blending all the colors, which looks really good on high res images. But on this low res image, it looks kind of muddy. So the PS1 would actually use closest, and there we can see it's a lot crisper, but you can see the pixels a lot better. Personally, I prefer it for this kind of style, and it looks very nice, but this is not the only texturing technique that they would use back then. So fun fact, Crash Bandicoot was actually not made with an image texture, but rather something called vertex colors, which are kind of obsolete nowadays. So doing them in Blender, it feels a little hidden away, but regardless, they're still here. So if you want to add a vertex color, you would come over here to color attributes and press plus and press OK and then come to the shading tab. We'll add a new material, which we'll call vert color. And you are going to add this node color attribute and then plug that in and select our one singular vertex color option here. So what a vertex color basically is, is instead of storing an image, it will store a color value in each vertex and then it will form a gradient between each of the vertices and whatever color they were respectively chosen. So if we come into vertex paint up here and we select a color, let's do something a crate would be. Let's do like a, let's do a brown over here. Let's do orange, there we go. You can see that as I color in, it's forming a very smooth gradient between the colors of each corner. And this is using a lot less storage than an image texture would use. So if you want to take that approach to modeling your character and texturing them, you absolutely can. You just have to take it into account when you're modeling them, because then you might end up having weird gradients that look kind of silly. But the most important thing we can do with this is we can actually fake lighting. Lighting is very, very intense on the PS1 console, so a lot of games opted to just not use it altogether and fake it using vertex colors. And the way we can do that is come into the shading tab. We're going to add a new color attribute to this object. We're going to add our color attribute node, and then we're going to mix this with our original image. So we're going to set a mix node to color, plug both into A and B, and set it to multiply. And then I usually set the factor to 1. And it's a completely black cube now, but it will not be for long because we're going to come to vertex paint. And let's say that, for example, our light was hitting this crate from above. We're going to put this crate in a room where there are overhead lights. So, oops, that's orange. We are going to paint this white light on the top corners of our crate. And now it looks like there's a shadow on the bottom of the crate. And we're doing that with no image texturing or anything. So we could even fake a shadow coming from the back over here by adding black here. And now we could comfortably tuck this into a corner and it would kind of look like it's actually being shaded by the environment when really we're just assigning colors to this object. Personally, I like doing this for rooms. It kind of adds a convincing ambient occlusion when if you come in here, we're going to be having ambient occlusion, screen space reflections, motion blur, and bloom off at all times. So if you want to convincingly fake this shadow, you can completely do that with vertex colors. So the next thing we are going to do is something called vertex snapping. So I'm not sure the actual term for it, but basically the PS1 could not calculate the position of vertices if they weren't a whole number. So there are no decimal places for the position of vertices. Like if we come into N, our N menu over here, and we move this vertice, we can see that the Z is at 1.2253. 
but on the PS1, it would be one and two and three. So we need to simulate that within our camera view without having that hardware present, which seems like it would be really difficult. But luckily, there is a wonderful, wonderful free plugin for Blender that I'm going to link in the description that lets you do this for an entire scene incredibly, incredibly easily. So I'm going to set up my camera and you should too. And we are going to open up the menu for this add-on. So basically what this add-on does is it's only like three buttons, but we're going to add a grid. I'd say a good size for the grid is usually around 200, but the size of the grid can go all the way up to 406. I'm not sure why it starts breaking after that, but 406 is the max. So we're going to add this grid and we're gonna position it right over our scene. So in this case, it's just a cube. So we're gonna put it right over our cube. It doesn't have to be exact. And then we're gonna click on our cube and we're going to add modifier and our PC is going to lag a little bit. So basically what's now happening to this object is that it is constantly snapping to each of the vertices on this camera's grid. So it's shaking and wobbling around a bit, and if we were to move this in our camera scene, it would look like this all the time. This effect is very, very convincing on characters specifically, because you can notice each of the vertices on a rounded object moving a little easier than on this cube object, but there is still one problem, which is that when we move the camera, nothing happens. Whereas if we were on a PS1, it would still continue vertex wobbling while the camera moves. So we are going to do something very, very interesting. So in order to make the vertices wobble with the camera, what we're going to do is select our grid, press Control A and all transforms, just so that the object is completely centered. Then we're gonna to come to object constraint, add a damped track and set it to the camera. And now we're gonna set that to X. I find that X is usually the best for this. And now if we move around the camera, the entire grid will track to the camera. So if we move around, we can see that the vertices still wobble even in the camera view, which is just absolutely rad. And if we're to move the box around, it continues wobbling, which looks really, really cool. And you can do this with an entire scene, just going through and adding the modifier on everything. There are a few more settings we can change, so we can come into color management and set this to standard. I find that it looks a lot better for these renders. And then we'll come into film and we'll set this filter size to zero. And this basically removes a lot of Blender's anti-aliasing giving us those kind of sharp, jagged edges, which are a little hard to see here, but, oh yeah, you can see it up here, pixelated edges that fall off really hard. And then if we come into our format section, now we're gonna set our frame rate to something just anywhere below 30. Personally, just for the stylized look, I really like the look of 12 frames per second, but if you want accuracy, I would set it somewhere from 24 to 30, because that's usually what those consoles would run at. So now that we've set up everything we need to for the actual style, and I've even put together this tiny little rotating animation, which I'm actually going to set to linear. Now we can head into the compositing tab and do some really simple effects. So if you want a pixelated low resolution effect, just come over to the resolution tab and I divide everything by four. So we have this completely 480p render and if we click render, you can see it's really small and when we zoom in, it's very pixelated. But if you wanna keep your image 1080p, but still have this pixelated effect, you will come into the compositing tab and we're going to add a scale, a pixelate, and another scale node. And we're gonna set the first scale to 0.25 on both axes, and then set the second scale node to four. And now when we render, it is a full 1080p image, but it's still really pixelated because of the compositing. And if you were to render the entire animation, the entire animation would be low res like that, which is really, really cool. But at least personally, I am going to use the method of dividing our resolution by four, just because I really like the low res look. So right before we render, we actually arrive at a bit of a crossroads. So the final effects we need are we are going to dither the entire scene. And there are two ways to do this. Either you can buy this $18 Blender plugin, which includes a lot of things. It includes a lot of neat features for the PSX style like texture wobble and vertex wobbling 
and you can even crush down all the colors in the scene. It is an incredibly impressive add-on, especially for the price. It is super, super underrated and absolutely worth the $18. So if you're going to be doing a lot of PSX style renders, I highly encourage you to buy this add-on because it is just incredible. The other path is you can always just not do the dithering, which is completely normal. A lot of the current uh, PS1 modding climate is just trying to remove the dithering because people don't like it and they think it makes their image unclear. So if you want to veer away from it a little bit stylistically, you can do without the dithering and be completely fine. But if you want to do the dithering for mostly free, as long as you have a copy of After Effects, and if you don't have a copy, you can get a copy. I'm, I'm not going to go into that. That's not my job. But if you have a copy of After Effects, this wonderful tutorial will show you how to dither your entire scene, and it looks absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see your PSX style renders at me on Twitter once you create them, because I would love to see them, and if you want critiques, I will give out critiques. Thank you all for watching, and goodbye.